I say this as your priest, so I'm not stepping away from the Mangalaya, although this is not a legitimate part of the uh, gospel. I, I said it earlier to people uh, who preceded some uh, who are here now. I, I wish to say it so that everybody has a chance to hear it. Um, you shouldn't be shaken. You shouldn't worry about anything that is occurring in our church now. Uh, having to do with the election of the next patriarch. Uh, what is happening now is a very good thing. Uh, what is happening now is that we are able to see into the people that are nominees for the patriarch. Whenever there is a lot of pressure and stress, character comes forth. Whenever there is a lot of pressure and stress, we see who prays and who manipulates. We see who is spiritual. We see who is political. When we come to this kind of thing, and we've been here before, there was the Council of Five Bishops, as the so-called Committee of Sadat, um, when Pope Shenouda was um, by order of Anwar Sadat, uh, confined to his monastery in Amba Bashoi. We've been through things uh, for the older people um, with the election of Anba Yasab to um, the Patriarchate, uh, who preceded Pope Carillus. So in our church, um, we look for the hand of God and we will see the hand of God. And you need not worry about what other people are doing because no one can rest himself from the grip of our Savior. <laughs> and um, we must have confidence. So if you have any feelings about this, for some of you, you may be quite oblivious and not even care. But for others of you, this is an invitation to pray. And we should thank God that we have a bishop, um, Amba Serapian, uh, that is um, looking uh, always for the truth. Uh, we, we, are, we are very blessed to have him. Oh. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, oh God, I mean. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Humanity, after the fall, always lived a very crude life. A very crude life. Uh, a very physical and brutal life. A life that was primitive and it was survival uh, of the fittest, whether that meant one's raw physicality or whether it meant the conniving mind of the person that instigated things for their own uh, pleasure and uh, ascendancy. But the primitive nature of man and uh, the crudeness of his life warranted some of the kinds of things that we see in the Old Testament being meted out by the hand of God. It was in proportion to man's, and it has always been in proportion to man's sensitivity to his maker about how subtle he will allow his maker to be. Did you ever wonder why somebody yells at you? Do you ever wonder why? It's because you didn't listen when they spoke softly. You were too crude. So they yelled, and you raised your voice. Or they were so passionate about the thing that they were doing at the time that they had no room for any other thought. So you yelled. Well, it's a terrible thing when God yells. You know, it sounds like earthquaking. 
and um, yet it has it has another it carries with it a, a, another quality because when Saint Paul was struck blind and there was an earthquake he he didn't say wow I wonder if that was a you know 7.0 Paul was prescient he may not have understood that Richter was going to be around but he was prescient he knew the future and he said Lord <laughs> I've never once said Lord except as a petition. <laughs> I had the opportunity to do that in the earthquake that happened to us just a couple days ago. Um, my wife, who is uh, always trying to show that she never needs me at all, as soon as the earthquake hit, you heard a shriek from one end of the house calling my name. <laughs> and I said, Sweetheart, there's really nothing I can do for you in this moment. <laughs> Except if I see something fall, I'll try to prevent it from falling on top of you. But I do not, and this will let you have an insight into my wife's psychology. She really does think I can control earth movement. <laughs> Hence the calling out of my name. But in the Old Testament, you see, um, the Lord dealt with us as a humankind in a manner that we would find and find today after the incarnation of the Lord we find it almost unbelievable that's why so many women especially don't want to read the Old Testament they don't want to read about the things that occurred that, that, that God told his people to do to those who lived around them and yet it was because of our primitive state of development. It wasn't that we didn't have higher thoughts as though we are now somehow, you know, moving in a way that would allow us to think of ourselves as uh, uh, Teilhard de Chardin did in The Phenomenon of Man, where we are um, anthropologically uh, going forward to point omega where we will somehow on our own through the process of evolution become like God. Theosis is a grace. It's granted. It's, it's not earned. Um, but at the same time we prepare ourselves for grace. We prepare ourselves for grace. Our, our own our own running towards personal sanctification is done so that if grace were to fall upon us we would be a vessel that would catch every last bit of it and not let anything fall to the ground. But in the Old Testament you have things that are kind of tough and in the beginning of this you have the same kind of thing. Salvation was given to the Jews by the Lord God that we worship. And what do the Jews do with it? They were very punitive. They were punitive to their own people. Don't you think that a person who is given, as I am standing before you, given to know the mysteries, the deepest mysteries of God, that I shouldn't then wear this in a very gentle way? The only time that you are going to find me tough is when there is opposition. When a person comes and says, may I have help, no one will ever say to me I was unkind or about me, unless they are liars. If someone comes to me and said, I need a word of encouragement, they will not leave me. And it's not because it's me, they will not leave any of the priests or they shouldn't be able to leave any of the priests. When someone is asking, it's not mine that I possess, it's another's. I possess grace. I possess grace in an abundance that if a million people came to me somehow, I would be able to give to each unstintingly because the grace is not mine. It belongs to God and it comes through me like a conduit, like a pipe, as water comes through a pipe. You don't bless the pipe, 
You praise the water that comes out of the pipe, that cleanses you and refreshes you. So in the same way, the Jews, why didn't they understand that they weren't supposed to go into someone's house and look at the spice and weigh it so that they could be certain that they got their tenth? Why didn't they look upon other peoples with the eye to educate rather than to isolate? Why weren't they more gentle? Well, we, we, we have some, some context in which we can uh, figure out certain of their motivations with a particular certainty, but there are other things we just have to ascribe to the crudeness of humankind. Crudeness, the primitive disposition of passions unallayed by any constraining intellect. So, in the parable that we have here, look, the, the Lord sent he sent the lawgiver, Moses. He sent judges. He sent kings. He sent prophets. None of them came away without a battering and a bruising. The Lord said to the Jews at the time of His incarnation, You killed the prophets. I killed them. You killed them all. According to history, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, was sawn in half with a wooden saw to make it more painful. It wasn't quick. So, when, when we complete the parable and we see that even the Son of Man, the Son of God, God Himself is incarnate, the Lord Savior Jesus Christ. They say, crucify Him. Crucify Him. So, um, in this time when Jesus is speaking and the, the Jews realize that uh, in the vernacular, the jig is up. <laughs> they say, no, 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 it can't be, it can't be. They say, but look what's going to happen. Now, the cornerstone that the builders rejected was the joining in Christ of the Jews and the Gentiles. It's the it's the coming together to form the foundation of the church. Because we are grafted into the vine, and St. Paul reminds us that we should not be proud because we are grafted in. But the vine is pre existing, it came to us from the Jews. And as we have been grafted in, we can be pruned away. So do not think over much about how bad the Jews were and how great the Gentiles in their faith in receiving the Lord were. Think rather that in my day, I do not want to emulate those who were crude. I do not want to emulate those that were primitive. I do not want my passions to have control of me. And I want in my own road to personal sanctification I want to clean myself so that when the Lord deigns to enter in, He finds an abode that is fitting. Remember what the centurion said, Lord, I'm not fit to have you come under the roof of my house, but say a word and I know my servant will be healed. While I say, Lord, Lord, enter in, I'm cleaning as fast as I can. It's a little bit dirty still, but put up with it and come. And I say this in boldness because of my love. I went to see, I went to see a, a family yesterday, and I haven't seen them for a couple of years. Not in their home. 
and and um, a family member from Egypt was there dying. She had come to be with the larger part of her family and they thought being in America that she might have access to a little bit better medical treatment. But I haven't seen this woman, this particular woman, I haven't seen her in about five years. And I kissed her and hugged her as much as I could uh, with regard to her condition. She, she's not going to be long among us. And she said to me, she rebuked me for not having seen her sooner. And I said, I carry you in my heart. And that's not just a kind word. I carry her in my heart. And when you love, when you really love, um, there is no displacement because of time or space. I love my aunt, and she is reposed in the Lord. I love my mother, and she is reposed in the Lord. I love my grandmother, and she is reposed in the Lord, and I remember them. My grandmother's breath used to always stink. She was a German woman. She liked to eat raw meat. They call it steak tartare. She liked to drink beer. She liked dill pickles. And she always had that odor about her. And she was five feet tall and five feet wide. And she had 14 children. She was one heck of a woman. Her name was Wilhelmina. And um, you didn't want to shorten her name to Willie. Mm. But I carry, I carry the memory. I carry, I, I carry the, the, the foods that she used to make me when I was a kid. I carry them inside me. And, and so I have boldness in front of the Lord to invite him into my home because my home, no matter what a hovel it looks like from the outside or how filthy it is on the inside, there is love. There is love. And I love these three women. So... I am not worried. Now it says that on whomever, uh, and this is the Lord, the, the gentleman, the, 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 the bridegroom, the, the, the lover of mankind, the philanthropic one. Whoever falls on him is going to be ground to powder. All right? On whomever he falls, actually. Again, this is in opposition. This is where I take my ethic about being the kind of priest that I am. Tough to those who oppose, kind to those who are supple and who wish to learn. Um, it says also that whoever will fall upon this cornerstone, now I'm talking about you and me, he will be broken. But in this breaking, it's the breaking of the control that passions have over us. That's why, John Barakat, we fast. We fast so that our passions don't take hold of us. That's why we fast. So that we are not self-directed, but God is directing us. So do I like to fast? No. If it were my church and not God's church, you would not fast. <laughs> You'd eat porterhouse steak and baked potato with chives and butter. Yeah. Yeah. Or you'd eat fool and koshery. Whatever your 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 whatever you like. But it wouldn't be a part of it. I'd think of some other way. We'd all be doing push ups and sit ups. Yeah, instead. We'd have some discipline, but it wouldn't be with food. That's why I'm fat. I love food.
I will always love food. But the sacrifice of my will to obey a command that is particularly hard for me is the proof to everyone of my faith. When it becomes easy for me to fast, I will no longer have this grace. I will no longer have it. I will not be able to say, here's proof. No, here's a man who wants to eat steak every day, several times a day, and has the money to do it. But when it's time to eat beans, I eat beans. When it's time to eat lentils, I eat lentils. When it's time to eat fish, I eat fish. And I don't like fish, and I don't like lentils, and I don't like beans. Well, I like beans, but they're barbecued beans with nice big fat pieces of pork. But you understand, in other words, when you are facing your passions, the, the, the proof of your faith is in the severity of the war. Some people don't have any problem with changing foods at all. It's not, it, it's not a problem for them. It will never be a problem. That doesn't make them sanctified and holy. Maybe they have a secret lust that no one can see from the outside. It's just inside. But the Lord sees that lust. And He knows whether or not they are obedient. Where we may. So someone is grumbling and muttering through the fasts. And other people are just whistling a happy tune. And they think, oh, look, what kind of a priest is that? He mutters and grumbles. And look what a nice guy that guy is over there. He's got everything. He should have been the priest. Huh? Take a look inside. Take a look inside. See what you find. So, we have nothing to fear from the Lord being the cornerstone. We have nothing to fear about uh, falling upon Him, because in falling upon Him, we will break the rele and, and release the hold. We will break and release the hold that our passions have upon us. That's the breaking that He is talking about. And we will, having these shackles removed from us, run free and run hard. So. We thank God for his, for his mercy and kindness. We thank God that he loved us so much that he took flesh and dwelt among us. And we thank God, the Holy Spirit, that he sustains us with the memory of all these acts. Glory be to the all holy trinity, both now and ever, and to the age of the Amen.